uh, I am really a 19th century historian who is straying across the boundary line into the 18th century uh, tonight. And I'll explain why I'm doing that in, in just a minute. Um, but I know there are some genuine experts on 18th century Ireland uh, on the call uh, today. So uh, please be gentle uh, with me and uh, tolerant of my of my mistakes. Um, so this is part of a, a larger project, as, as Andrew's just said, um, uh, a study of the, the life and the uh, political contexts of the 19th century um, Ulster radical William Sharman Crawford. Um, and as I've been working on him, uh, the project has expanded into kind of more, more of a three generational study of the uh, development and transmission of strands in Ulster radicalism uh, between the later 18th century and the end of the 19th century, even to some extent into the first decades of the 20th century. So the wider study encompasses uh, the life of not just um, William Sharman Crawford, 1780 to 1861, but of his father, who's a huge influence on, on his politics. Um, William Sharman, 1731 to 1803, and to a lesser extent, his father-in-law, who I'll mention just very briefly in this paper, John Crawford of Crawfordsburn, um, who, like his friend William Sharman, was a leading figure in the volunteer movement in East Ulster uh, in the, the 1780s and 1790s. Uh, and then the study will run through uh, to William Sharman Crawford's children, particularly two of them, uh, James, um, who becomes the Gladstonian Liberal MP for County Down, uh, in the 1870s, 1874 to 8, and his daughter Mabel, uh, who lives until 1912, uh, who's a travel writer, a feminist, social commentator, and a member of the women's suffrage movement in both Ireland and England. But the, the focus of today's paper is, is William Sharman. Uh, he, so who is he? He's a middle-ranking member of the volunteer movement in, of the 1780s and 1790s, a colonel, uh, the colonel of the, of the Union Regiment of Volunteers, based in the Lagan Valley and Middown. Um, but a man who emerges by the mid-1780s uh, as a leading figure in Ulster in the campaign to attain democratic political reforms to secure the legislative independence granted to the Irish Parliament in 1782, and who came to embrace Catholic emancipation as an essential measure. The Sharman's role in the radical politics of volunteering has tended to be rather overlooked. Uh, although for a, a time he is an MP, he lacks, he lacks the national profile of, of the very well-known patriot leaders of the late 18th century, um, such as Henry, Henry Grasson and Henry Flood. Um, and at the same time, as a, as a landed Anglican, uh, he's not part of the radical Presbyterian circles of Belfast that have attracted uh, so much historical attention. Uh, indeed, though taking a central part, as we'll see, in the celebrations of the French Revolution in Belfast in 1791, he did not join the United Irishmen and sat uh, out the catastrophe of the 1798 rebellion in the North in political retirement uh, at Moira Castle. So this paper is an attempt to recover the non-revolutionary radical politics that he embodied, uh, its popular dynamics and its limitations, its frustration in the 1790s and its legacy looking forward to 19th century Ulster. So a little bit first about the, the volunteers, for those of you unfamiliar with them. I can get my screen to work. There we are. Um, so the volunteers were a self-funded Irish popular military movement, independent of the state, which emerged in 1778 as a self-defense force against a potential French invasion during the, the American Revolutionary War, uh, first in Belfast and then spreading out across the island. The movement drew on older traditions of Protestant voluntary militias raised to deal with military emergencies, but it rapidly became politicized and was drawn into controversies over Ireland's trading relations with Britain and the British Empire, um, with uh, uh, into controversy, controversies over the constraints on Irish self-government and subsequently the structure of the Irish Parliament and the limits of representation within it. The great majority of volunteers thus came to endorse the case made by the Irish Patriot opposition leadership in Parliament that Ireland's constitutional as well as commercial subordination to Great Britain must be ended and that its legislative independence as a sister kingdom under the British Crown be conceded. In February 1782, the first of a series of conventions attended in this case by 250 delegates representing the 25,000 volunteers of the province of Ulster, assembled at Dungannon in County Tyrone to endorse a set of political resolutions 
prepared by the Patriot leadership demanding legislative independence. That is the freedom of the Irish Parliament uh, to uh, manage its own affairs without uh, control by, by, by the British executive and the British Parliament. And while this meeting uh, in Dungannon agreed to support the parliamentary campaign, it did so in a manner that justified the right and indeed the responsibility of the volunteer movement to act politically. So this campaign, this joint parliamentary and uh, outdoors campaign by the volunteers was successful in extracting the so-called Constitution of 1782. Uh, from a weak British government in that year, but the limitations and reality of the new politics were quickly apparent uh, and became more so as a more effective uh, and decisive British government was formed in early 1784 uh, under William Pitt. The politics of volunteering after 1782, which I'm going to be focusing on uh, in this paper, increasingly uh, were focused on two more divisive uh, issues for the movement. First of all, parliamentary reform which was loudly demanded by the middle class and the more radical gentry members of the movement and had growing support from tenant and artisan members, uh, particularly in the Northeast, but potentially threatened the control of landed magnates over many parliamentary boroughs, par uh, landed magnates who uh, had previously, in, in some cases, supported the volunteer movement. The second divisive issue is Catholic emancipation. That is the admission of Catholics to equal political rights which had been denied to them by penal legislation of the uh, late 17th and early 18th century, centuries. And this, this issue, Catholic emancipation, sharply divides radical from conservative Protestants within the volunteer movement. So having said out who the volunteers were, uh, were let me go, go back a step and, and say a bit about uh, William Sharman and how he comes to play a prominent role within the movement. So William Sharman is... Um, the eldest son of uh, John Sharman of Akavari in County Antrim, which is near, near uh, Tomb in County Antrim, a small landowner of about 140 acres and a member of the Church of Ireland. Following his father's death, uh, William Sharman was educated in law uh, at Trinity College Dublin and, and then Lincoln's Inn in London, was called to the bar but never practised. So as a very minor member uh, of the Protestant landed interest, uh, his prospects were greatly enhanced uh, by his, in, in, his inheritance in 1775 of the property of his uncle, Captain William Sharman of Bonnybrook, uh, County Dublin. So there's going to be a lot of William Sharmans uh, in this, this paper. So I'll, uh, my principal subject will be, will be Colonel uh, William Sharman, but his uncle, who he inherits land from, is, is Captain William Sharman. So this Captain William Sharman had married into the O'Neill family of Shane's Castle, one of the leading landed families of County Antrim, and had been an MP uh, sitting for one of the O'Neill's pocket boroughs, uh, that, that of Randallstown, um, and had been a member of the Linen Board in Dublin. And he'd acquired uh, large plots of land in County Down, uh, between Banbridge and Rathfryland, in the, in the barony of Upper, uh, Upper Ivy, uh, and a smaller estate also in, uh, at Stolene in County Meath. And this, uh, in turn, uh, Captain Sharman had inherited these lands from his uncle, uh, General Richard Kane, uh, also from County Antrim, who had been a British governor of the uh, island of, of Menorca, which was under, under British rule uh, um, uh, in the wake of the, um, of the War of the Spanish Succession. Um, so from around 1756, William Jr., uh, my William, uh, William Sharman, holds the post of revenue collector in the town of Lisburn, um, a post worth £300 a year and most likely acquired as a consequence of his uncle's access to patronage in Dublin. Um, but the inheritance, the inheritance of his, of his uncle's land, his uncle uh, dies childless in 1775, allows him to establish himself as a country gentleman. Uh, renting from 1774, the house and the domain of um, Moira Castle from the first Earl of Moira, with whom Sharman developed a close association and lent money to. Uh, the, Earl, or, or the Earls of, uh, of Moira were constantly in, in the serious debt. Uh, Sharman had inherited a lot of money from his uncle and he establishes a financial as well as a personal relationship with Moira. Moira himself was involved in patriot politics, which I'll come back to in just a minute. In 1772, um, William Sharman had married his uncle, with his uncle's approval, uh, Arminella, 
uh, daughter of Hill Wilson, a landowner at Purdy's Burn in County Down, and the collector of customs for Belfast. So this kind of introduces him to, into a further network uh, of uh, small landowners uh, but with, with significant political positions in, in, the, in the Belfast area. Armanella, who had moved in fashionable London circles, appears to have uh, been regarded as a very desirable match. Um, and she proves, uh, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, an able partner for William in his subsequent political career. So at this point, uh, you know, in the mid-1770s, William Sharman is the product, very clearly the product, of an 18th century Anglo-Irish gentry world in which religious conformity, inheritance, a good marriage, government service, and above all, patronage were crucial to getting on. There's nothing here that looks particularly radical. But he was also open, I think, to the changing intellectual and political climate of later 18th century East Ulster, and from the early 1780s began to adopt positions which would have probably shocked uh, his quite conservative uh, uncle, Captain Sharman of Bonnybrook, had he still been alive. As collector of, of customs uh, at, um, and revenue at Lisburn, um, and at first resident in the town, he would have been conscious of the wealth generated from the burgeoning linen industry in the district, which was opened up to the, the port of Belfast with the opening of the lag, lag and navigation in 1765. At the same time, uh, William Sharman could not but have been aware of the social conflicts generated by the development of rapid proto-industrialization and by the greater commercialization of tenurial relations, which sparked serious rioting uh, by the Lisburn weavers in the town, uh, in 1762 against their employers and social superiors. Um, and then a decade later, which sees the outbreak of violent agrarian protests uh, in County Down, taking the form of a secret society calling itself the Hearts of Flint, uh, which is a local variant of the Hearts of Steel, which had emerged a few years earlier on Lord Donegal's estates uh, in, in County Antrim, in protest against increased rents and fines imposed on the working farmers by Donegal and his middlemen tenants. So this insurgency, this steel boy, flint boy insurgency in the early 1770s alarmed uh, many of the landed uh, proprietors, including Lady Moira, uh, at, uh, Moira, then resident at Moira Castle in 1772, who writes an alarm to the Lord Lieutenant uh, requesting military assistance. And this may have spurred uh, the, the Moira family to decide to, to leave Moira Castle and to move to their other estate uh, at Mont Alto near Balna Hinch and to let their, their Moira Castle house uh, to the Sharmans. As late as 17, March 1774, it was rumoured that the Steel Boys had set fire to Lord Moira's coach house and carriages, though it later transpired this was the result of an accident rather than arson. But for the new residents of the castle in 1774, the Sharmans, uh, challenges arose as to how best to engage with the disruptive social forces which had sparked the outbreaks of, of several years before um, to, and to find ways of channeling um, this social discontent into respectable and patriotic forms of expression and to rebuild bonds of sociability between the landed elite, the urban middle classes and the surrounding rural population of farmers, labourers and weavers in a religiously mixed environment. William Sharman would rise to this task in the early 1780s, and in doing so, his politics would move in a much more radical direction. The Sharman was um, anxious to present himself as a benevolent landowner when he inherits the land. Uh, uh, one sympathetic Belfast publication gave his annual rental uh, uh, income in the 1780s as £3,000, which is quite a lot of money, uh, adding that this was not wrung from the bowels of a pillaged tenantry and which he expends in relieving the distresses of the poor and wiping the wiping the eye uh, from the from the tear of or wiping the tear from the eye of misery. He was also praised in print by an anonymous county down farmer in 1787 as one of one of the leading agricultural improvers in the county. His upper Ivy holdings, which you can see on the map here, comprised of, of parts of ten townlands in rolling Drumland country, um, to the north of Rath Fryland. Uh, were not contiguous and lacked a suitable grand residence, but were within reasonable traveling distance from Moira, which lay uh, about 18 miles to the northwest. And he may well have adopted the model of uh, an improving landlord from Lord Moira himself, um, 
who was a member of the Irish Linen Board and an active promoter of both flax cultivation and industrial cloth production on his, his, his estates. And indeed, Moira was the dedicatee of one of William Hinks' renowned 1783 series of 12 engravings of the Ulster linen trade. Um, uh, the one you can see here, that depicting women spinning, reeling with the clock reel and boiling the yarn, which was, according to Hinks, taken on the spot in a county down cottage, and as you can see, dedicated to the Earl of Moira. So Sharman's political development appears similarly to have been shaped for a time by this relationship with Lord Moira, who he followed uh, into in embracing uh, a liberal patriot uh, political position within Irish Protestant politics in the later 1770s and early 1780s, thereby placing him, himself into opposition to the government uh, at Dublin Castle, despite his official employment as a local revenue officer. And indeed in 1784, Sharman was removed from his official post uh, for this political defiance. Um, uh, uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So let's come back to the volunteers. So it appears Lord Moira was responsible for raising volunteer companies uh, at Balnahinch and then up in, in the village of Moira itself in 1779. But the first reference to William Sharman uh, being involved comes um, in uh, an issue of the Dublin Evening Press in July 1781, noting a meeting of the Moira Corps uh, of the volunteers the previous month at which Sharman was thanked for his great attention and friendship to the company and for a generous present of 60 stands of arms and a band of music. So this amounted to quite an extensive outlay in, in terms of, of arms and equipment uh, for the Moira company uh, but it was a popular one, no doubt, given the government's reluctance to arm the volunteer companies with working weaponry. In response, the Moira Company resolved that we will, upon every occasion, use our utmost endeavours to preserve the peace and execute the laws of our country as the most convincing proof we can give of our sincere gratitude to our worthy captain. If Sharman's first command was partly due to deference towards him as the village's resident squire, and his ability to equip the, the unit, it owed something as well to the support he received from the local Presbyterian minister, the Reverend Andrew Craig, a volunteer enthusiast and chaplain who requested he, that, that he, Sharman, take on the, uh, a leadership role contrary to the expectations and perhaps the wishes of some of the neighboring gentlemen who took no part in the movement. And William Sharman's closeness to Presbyterian political agents, starting with Craig, in 1781 was to remain marked throughout his volunteering career and indeed Craig subsequently became he was subsequently the um uh, the minister of first Lisburn Presbyterian Church became his brother-in-law by the following year in 1782 Sharman had been elected lieutenant colonel of the Union Regiment of Volunteers a name which reflected the amalgamation of the Moira Balna Hinch Rosevale and first Lisburn companies uh, the, the, technically, the regimental colonel was Lord Moira, but he played relatively little active part, and uh, Sharman himself becomes the full colonel of the regiment in 1784. Reflecting its, its uh, quasi-democratic nature, there, and there is a, a painting of Sharman in his volunteer uniform, which, I'll, which I'll, again I'll return to a little bit later and say more about it. But reflecting its quasi-democratic nature, the, the regiment's corps sent delegates to meet at Moira Market House in April 1782 to debate the resolutions passed at the Dungannon Convention that February. They resolved at a meeting chaired by Sharman that while loyal to Crown and the British connection, His Majesty's people of Ireland are a free people, inheritors of a free constitution descended uh, to them from their ancestors, and that it is an undoubted right of this free people, a right which they value with their, uh, as their lives, to be governed solely by their own laws. That the King, Lords and Commons of Ireland are the only representatives of this crown and people, and the interposition of any other body of men with the legislature of this country is incompatible with our fundamental laws and franchises. So this is very much on message uh, with the, the Dungannon Convention resolutions. In such an atmosphere of rising political expectations, increasingly popular participation in political debate and insistence following on from the American example, 
uh, on the consent of the people for the legitimacy of political institutions. Sharman's position within the movement be became increasingly dependent on his ability to articulate and support popular sentiment rather than simply on his social status. So he may have become captain initially because he has the money to arm and to uh, equip the unit, uh, but he, he very much will have to remain an officer and to rise within the volunteers um, to be elected uh, to the colonelship of the Union Regiment, he needs to articulate the sentiments which are becoming dominant, the political sentiments becoming dominant within the movement. It's very likely that Charman followed Lord Moira in granting his own tenants uh, a free vote in the County Down election in 1783, a step which became a family principle from that time, uh, when most landowners continued to regard their freeholders as political property to be directed by the, the, the estate office. Uh, and although the volunteers are successful in getting Edward Ward elected as an MP for County Down, one of the two MPs for County Down, they were unable to unseat Lord Kilwarlan, who represented the Conservative Hill interest, the Hill, Hills of Hillsborough, uh, at that election. And indeed, Kilwarlan topped the poll despite his open antipathy to volunteer objectives. Um, and this, this creates quite a storm within the volunteer movement uh, in County Down, uh, uh, which, which impacts on the Union Regiment. Um, there, is, there, there, um, there is a backlash against any members of the volunteers who ha have voted for or uh, signed resolutions in support of Kilwarlan in the wake uh, of the election. Um, and indeed, the Union Regiment appears to have incorporated an element of democratic principle into its practice of internal discipline. When an officer in the regiment was accused of having signed a counter memorial issued by the Hill interest against reform uh, during the Down election, his fellow officers, including Sharman, resolved not to take action against, them, against him themselves, but rather to subject him to public hearings before the rank and file of each of the five companies of the regiment. And only one of these, his own uh, company, First Lisburn, accepted his defense that in signing the memorial, he had acted as a freeholder and not as a volunteer. The regiment as a whole took the, took the view, uh, uh, took, uh, essentially supported the, the view of the Balna Hinch Company, uh, which said it could never associate with a corps who continued in command, a man who was doubly guilty of baseness to his country, of contumacious perseverance and ill-doing, and then expelled him publicly, an action it deemed justly consonant with the spirit of the times and with the honor of a regiment worthy of such a patriotic leader as Colonel Sharman. So essentially the four of the five companies vote to expel this officer uh, and he has to leave. Um, there is uh, a certain cost to, to this form of internal democracy within uh, the, the regiment, despite its high regard for Colonel Sharman, Personally, the entire First Lisburn Company decides to leave the regiment and to join, uh, join a separate regiment as a consequence of this expulsion. So Sharman's new command, this Union Regiment, uh, incorporated units initially from Lisburn uh, and from nearby Rosevale in the parish of Blairus, both of which lay on, uh, on the estates of the absentee, absentee um, Earl of Hartford. Political discontent would be growing in the developing linen town of Lisburn and its environs for some time. Um, and a satirical squib against the borough of Lisburn's two MPs, representing them as gluttonous and corrupt clients of the landlord, appeared in 1779. A subsequent town meeting the following year upheld patriot demands for the repeal of Poyning's Law and the Declaratory, Declaratory Act, which had subordinated Irish legislation to the veto of the British Privy Council and Parliament. Lord Hartford's public statement in 1782 that the volunteers should be content with having achieved free trade and legislative independence and that the country should put its commercial development ahead of any further agitation did not endear him to the town's radicals. Other uh, volunteering uh, units are formed within Lisburn, such as the True Blues and the Lisburn Fusiliers, whose captain was the future Patriot MP and indeed future United Irishman, William Todd Jones. And they're equally outspoken in advocating political reform by 1782. So Lisbon is a very radical place um, uh, uh, by the uh, by the by the mid 1780s, and we'll see that uh, reflected in its political behaviour um, that year. So this assertive radicalism evident in the time very much works to Sharman's political benefit. 
Uh, all of the units, uh, the Lisburn units and the Union Regiment, participate in summer manoeuvres in Belfast from 1782, bringing the local radicals of the Lagan Valley into connection with the reformist networks in Ulster's most populous and rapidly developing town. And indeed, about 4,000 volunteers participate in the uh, Belfast Review in August 1782, combining an assertion of military display with an inclusive and politicised camaraderie. So the, the, the military capacity of the volunteers as anything more than a local peacekeeping force has been disputed. I mean, they're very much a kind of amateur, an amateur uh, outfit. Uh, even while the numbers expanded rapidly to a, a reported peak of 89,000 by um, mid-1782. Their abilities were never put to the test as no invasion or insurrection occurred during their period of existence. Nevertheless, newly elected amateur officers faced a, a steep learning curve. Unlike his uncle, uh, William Sharman had no previous military experience, and as an officer would have been dependent on instructional manuals, such as the Concise Compendium for Military Maneuvers, published in Dublin specifically for the volunteers in 1781, an illustration from which you can see here on the screen. He seems to have taken his responsibilities as a corps and later a regimental commander very seriously uh, and promoted military order and skills throughout his part-time and voluntary soldiery retaining significant numbers of active members within his units until their eventual demise in 1793. By 1784, the Union Regiment num numbered 300 men and had acquired two six-pounder field guns. And in 1791, it was differentiated into a troop of horse, uh, a few companies of grenadiers and light infantry, and a very fine band of music. One English observer noted of the regiment that year, they are in general very fine men and are well clothed, appointed and disciplined. It's unclear if Sharman also contributed to the cost of their uniforms, as some volunteer officers did, but the regiment was distinguished by scarlet and green trimming to their military uh, tunics. This is obviously a much later image, uh, late 19th century, imagining of what the Lisburn uh, um, uh, volunteers would have looked like in 1782. But uh, I mean, the images that survive from the time are not very dissimilar in terms of the uniforms. Music was obviously very important to the movement. A martial air entitled Colonel Sharman's Quick Step was composed for regimental gatherings. More seriously, Sharman sought to develop musketry skills through regular competitions for the best marksmen in each company and the regiment, with the winners being awarded silver or gold medals at his expense. These medals bore the patriotic symbol of the Irish angel harp and the, the crown uh, and the with a crown and the muscle for our country. These were the emblems and the motto inscribed also on the belt plates and the officers' gorgets of the Moira volunteers. So it's quite clear that uh, alongside this, if you like, uh, at least attempt to develop some form of, of military form, the volunteer, uh, the volunteer Elan is very much dependent on a culture of male sociability uh, that at least temporarily appears to elide class differences between officers and men. This is very much, I suppose, the kind of vision uh, which, which uh, Sharman is, is buying into. Following a parade uh, at Moira, in October 1783, the entire company repaired to the market house to dine with their, quote, beloved colonel, following which many spirited toasts were drunk and the evening spent in the utmost festivity and harmony. So they're all having a very good time. And this is very, obviously a very far cry from the class related unrest of 1762 and 1772 in the same district. Now, so Sharman's political standing within the volunteers appears to have risen rapidly uh, in 1782 to three, at a time when the movement was convulsed by divisions created by Henry Flood's campaign for a formal renunciation of Britain's claim to legislate for Ireland and the defection of more moderate officers to the newly formed government fencible force. In July 1783, Sharman chaired the, a meeting of representatives of 45 Ulster Corps at Lisburn, which resolved to requisition another provincial convention at Dungan, this time to focus on the subject of parliamentary reform. Sharman was further selected to act as the Secretary of the Committee of Correspondence of the Ulster Volunteers, with responsibility for preparing the resolutions of the conference, or sorry, the convention, and eliciting the opinions of the leading English reformers to inform the deliberations of the convention. Uh, an address to the Volunteer Army of Ulster, 
um, which was um, published under his name in July 1783, strongly asserted the continuing right, now that the American war was over, of the volunteers to act as a body of armed citizens to ensure that the objectives of, the, of legislative independence were realized in practice. The case was couched in the Whiggish language of restoring the balance of the ancient constitution, which had been corrupted by venality and party interests. And you can see from the final the paragraph there, parliamentary reform, uh, the, the statement says, was the only measure that can give permanency to the late renovation of our constitution or restore that virtue to the representative body without which, though the mere forms of a free government may be preserved, its spirit must inevitably perish. Now, this um, statement, the, the uh, address to the volunteer army, does not explicitly reference Catholic emancipation, but it hints at it in noting that by inculcating the glorious spirit of toleration, it has united the once distressed inhabitants of this country into an indissoluble mass. Thinking such proceedings un unconstitutional, Lord Charlemagne, does not, as the national commander of the volunteers, declined to participate in the 1783 Dun Dungannon Convention and warned against including the Catholic question in any of their deliberations, leaving Charman and his committee to proceed at their own risk. Henry Grattan agreed with Charlemagne that continuing outdoor agitation could be, would be counterproductive and potentially upset the 1782 settlement. So following this up later that month, uh, a letter issued by the Committee of Correspondence noted that the representatives of 15,000 volunteers in Munster as well as Ulster had already expressed support for the principle of parliamentary reform and urged Corps to send delegates to Dungannon with powers to agree a specific plan of action. Letters were issued under Sharman's name to the leading English reformers, including the Duke of Richmond, Richard Price, Major Cartwright, John Jebb and Charles Wyville which elicited supportive statements along with differing recommendations for reform and Catholic emancipation. Reading the published letters, what well, you can see they're published here in this, in this volume, um, the Belfast radical, radical Martha McTeer singled out Wyville's and Richmond's as excellent, while she thought the Irish submissions by Henry Grattan, Flood and Charlemont were poor and insufficient, and that of William Pitt amounted to nothing. Ultimately, this, the decision of how to proceed lay with the volunteer convention itself. As Sharman noted in his letters of acknowledgement, composed after the convention, where we find great and good men equally zealous in the cause differ with respect to the mode, not only, not, uh, uh, sorry, where we find great and good men equally zealous in the cause differ with respect to the mode, our only choice is that which seemed to us most applicable to the country we live in. The corresponding, committee, corresponding committee's proposals to the 1783 Dungannon Convention were remarkably radical for the period. They recommended annual parliaments, vote by secret ballot, the abolition of mean, decayed and depopulated boroughs, with transfer of those seats to unenfranchised or underrepresented towns and counties. Male 40 shilling freeholders should have the vote in the counties, householders renting properties worth five pounds per annum and above in the boroughs. Uh, but no menial servants to have the vote unless they were house, a householder paying rates. Bribery of electors was to be criminalized on both sides. And crucially, the committee recommended extension of the suffrage to such description of Roman Catholics as the National Convention may deem proper objects of this great trust. A statement of support for emancipation in principle, but hedging on the details. In line with contemporary thinking, the resolutions made no mention of enfranchising women, uh, although the government press sought to undermine the reformers by mischievously asserting that they had inspired a female committee to assert women's inherent rights and no longer patiently to be excluded from a share of the legislature of the kingdom. The, Conve the Dungannon Convention of 1783 thanks Sharman and the committee and endorses uh, his recommendations, nominating five delegates from each county, including Sharman himself, to represent them a, a national convention of volunteers in Dublin that November. But this, however, is as far as the volunteer reform project was to go at that time. Uneasy about the political implications of Catholic emancipation, patriot leaders such as Flood and Charlemont marginalized it from the debates, while at the same time overplaying their hand on parliamentary reform. 
Flood's appearance in the Irish Commons, Hotfoot, Hotfoot from the National Convention at the Rotunda, still wearing his volunteer uniform as he proposed a reform bill based on the Dungannon resolutions, provoked hostility from the Commons and abandonment by his former Patriot ally, Henry Grattan. The reform bill was thrown out by 158 votes to 49, and Charlemagne persuaded the volunteers to disperse without further challenges to parliamentary authority. So this was a major defeat, uh, but it did not lead to a collapse in, in, uh, of belief in the volunteer project on the part of men like William Sharman. At the general election of summer 1783, he was elected one of the two MPs for the borough of Lisburn, which we've already seen as becoming very radical. Lisburn was a, what, what was called a pot walloping borough with an electorate of between 350 and 400 taxpaying householders, usually under the tight control of the absentee landowner, the, the Earl of Hartford. But with volunteer enthusiasm at its peak, Sharman and his fellow volunteer officer, William Todd Jones, stood on a platform that exhorted independent electors to vote with their consciences and spurn attempts to bribe or intimidate them. With volunteer enthusiasm at its peak in the town and renewed economic distress also undermining traditional forms of deference, they carried the hustings and, quote, after polling a few tallies, they were declared fully, uh, duly elected and chaired with every honour. The town is in general uh, a blaze of rejoicing for the glorious triumph of a people over an aristocracy that formerly ruled that borough and the county with a rod of iron. Uh, one epic poet, one would be epic poem penned locally extolled the episode with some hyperbole as Rome delivered and tyranny expelled by Messrs. Sharman and Jones of Lisburn. However, it seems that Sharman found participation in, in the so-called Grattan's Parliament uh, very frustrating. Along with other popular MPs, he was fined for non-attendance at parliamentary committees, possibly as a form of disruption. And although a rare parliamentary speaker, uh, his prominence in opposition ranks, as well as uh, in the continuing volunteer movement, led to his dismissal from the post as collector of Lisbon in 1784, an event which provoked protests from the Patriot Press the Constitution Club of Belfast, and at least one piece of political verse, praising steady Sharman, faithful to his trust, a feared not, though a placeman, to be just. One parliamentary commentator praised his character for having imbibed from the best remains of antiquity that spirit of independence, which formed its glory. He uniformly acts with a manly decision and a prudent zeal, while noting that an excess of diffidence and modesty had curbed his contributions to debate. For his part, Sharman praised his constituents for setting a memorable example of reformation to the boroughs of this kingdom and assured them that he regarded himself as their delegate to Parliament and governed by their wishes. Uh, he wrote to the, the electors of Lisbon, if the people who ought to be their own governors cannot govern their own representatives, I should very much fear lest legislation itself might be reckoned illegal. When the interests of kingdoms and generations become the subject of discussion, it is not the voice of 300, but that of 3 millions, which ought to sanctify the conclusion. So these radical politics placed him deeply at odds with the conservative county gentry, Lord Hillsborough complained to the Lord Lieutenant in 1783 that Sharman had distinguished himself in a very extraordinary degree in opposition to the King's government and to your excellency's administration, having continually voted against you and being determined to continue to do so, and having violently opposed me in the county down because I am firmly attached to both. Now, what did patriotism mean to William Sharman? Although by no means an original thinker or writer, he left some commentary on political and economic affairs in his papers uh, for this period. Notes made for an apparently undelivered speech suggested a patriotism that veered toward an anglophobic economic nationalism. Uh, and I quote from, from the, the, the draft speech, Ireland, was never Ireland never contained two thirds of the inhabitants she ought to contain. It is by means such as these that there is in this kingdom perpetual scarcity and periodical famine. Great Britain intruded herself into this country, not for the purpose of extirpation, but of subjection. The linen manufacture is the only breath that is left to, to an asthmatic people to keep alive a feeble existence just sufficient to produce a crop of consumers of British manufacturers, just sufficient to recruit that army, which has made and still keeps us as a province, just sufficient to produce those taxes which are to pay it. 
uh, or if not able to do that, to become a mortgage, uh, um, to become a mortgage for loans for that purpose, just sufficient to produce those salaries and pensions, which which make it the interest of a few to connive at the humiliation of the many. Consistent with with such views, he voted against the introduction of Pitt's commercial resolutions for equalising trade with Great Britain in 1785, in defence, as he saw it, of Irish economic interests. The Sherman's constitutional thinking was never fully articulated on paper, but it's likely he drew on the patri on patriotic publications, such as the Reverend William Crawford's History of Ireland of 1783, which sought to historicize volunteering as embodying a combination of radical Whig civic republicanism of the 17th century, which was only, which was only partially, partially realized by the Glorious Revolution of 1688, with the Irish patriot tradition, patriot tradition dating back to Molyneux and Swift, that identified Irish interests as separate and antithetical to those of Great Britain. So Sharman remained committed to pursuing reform through non-parliamentary agitation. In 1784, a county Antrim meeting attended by over 500 nominated him and others as delegates to a new national Congress on reform. This body, which provocatively drew on American Republican terminology, and which was shunned by many respectable volunteers and actively subverted by the government, elected Sharman as its chair when it convened in Dublin in October 1784. However, this meeting was poorly attended and beset by leadership conflicts between Flood and the Dublin radical firebrand Napper Tandy, and it came to nothing. The poor attendance frustrated Sharman and spurred the young William, uh, Dr. William Drennan, who was there as the representative of the Newry volunteers, to pen his letters of Orellana, an Irish helot, in, in an attempt to stimulate nor absent Northerners into belated participation. Sharman's own comments on this failure came close to despair. If you should lament, he wrote, as we now do, the necessity of our adjournment at so, adjournment at so interesting a period. We trust that you will attribute it more to a want of sanction and assistance of those who are absent than to a want of perseverance in those who have faithfully attended to their duty. Parliament cannot speak the voice of the people unless the people lift up their voice to Parliament. Yet he continued to offer the delegates a hope of eventual success, grounded on enlightenment understanding of the progress and eventual triumph of human reason. Lightening the, likening the reformers to scientific pioneers such as Galileo and Columbus, who had been dismissed in their own time, but vindicated by history. Now, P.D.H. Smith, in his, his survey of the volunteers in Parliament, describes the, the Northern Volunteer Reviews of the summer of 1784 as the last twitchings of the corpse of political volunteering, and omits even to mention the Dublin Congress of that autumn. And clearly it's true that volunteering was in decline nationally and losing coherence in the face of internal divisions over its objectives and legitimacy, a hostile Dublin castle backed by a strong British administration and contempt on the part of many Irish MPs. But men like Sharman were however reluctant to abandon any their faith in the movement. While participating in non-military bodies such as the Dublin Reform Club and continuing to support, just to support parliamentary motions for reform, this did not mean uh, that he had lost interest in volunteering. And indeed, in October 1784, William and Armanella Sharman, Sharman entertained the Union Regiment in a Temple of Liberty erected for that purpose in the Moira Domain after the regiment had staged a mock battle before a crowd of spectators. The description of the event in the press gives a flavor of both the local popularity of the couple and the utilization of emblems of enlightened civic republicanism in this rural environment. Um, so this is, this is from the Volunteers Journal. It is impossible to describe, to describe the elegance, the grandeur and the brilliancy of the scene that succeeded. Mrs. Sharman had fitted up for the reception of the regiment a gallery 90 feet long in a style that gave a most convincing proof of her generosity and taste. Over the arch of the entrance was inscribed in large characters, the Temple of Liberty. From the floor uh, was raised 22 arches of laurel boughs. The roof consisted of nine Gothic arches comprised of the same, from which hung 12 branches, which served to illuminate the building. Perhaps uh, there have been few instances of such a crowd of guests entertained in so elegant and so splendid a manner. All was joy, harmony and ease. Everyone vied with his neighbour in extolling the hospitality and taste of their beloved Colonel and his amiable lady. 
Many spirited and patriotic toasts were drunk. The night was crowned with utmost festivity and the whole party departed pleased and happy. And this is an, a, an interesting glimpse uh, of Armanella Sharman as a popular political hostess, a role she shared with many Irish women drawn into, the active, into active involvement with the patriotic politics of the era. Nor were these Moira demonstrations of the mid 1780s a swan song for the movement in the region. William Sharman continued to, to command his Union Regiment, uh, a popular uh, annual summer reviews uh, in Belfast, Dromore, and Moira in 1785 to 7, still anticipating a change in the wind that would propel the movement back to the forefront of reforming politics. Um, and this finally comes, uh, at least it appears to come with uh, the uh, outbreak of the French Revolution in the summer of 1789. At Dromore in September 1789, in the wake of the fall of the Bastille, the Union Regiment carried out, uh, again, another mock battle, uh, which involves storming the market house uh, in what may have been a conscious echo of Parisian events. Uh, Charmin addressed the volunteers on the after this event on the legitimacy of bearing arms in defense of liberty and the moral duty of electors to act against the political plunderers of the country. And in their response, the volunteers at Dromore lamented the present state of the country should, should be so unfavorable to the exertion of a virtue like yours and observed signs of a change in the wind, hoping that a portion of that light whose brilliancy at the moment illuminates a neighboring kingdom with such distinguished luster would soon fall upon Ireland. And indeed the phenomenal impact of the French Revolution would soon lead to both a, wide, a wider revival of political volunteering and a resurg resurgence of radicalism that would alarm and ultimately eclipse that of Charmin and the men of his generation. Um, in March 1790, uh, the Northern Whig Club was uh, founded in Belfast to promote parliamentary reform and attracted significant numbers of middle of radical middle class members, uh, many also active volunteers, um, alongside a few more conservative members, such as Lord Charlemont. Uh, William Sharman and his um, fellow ex-MP by this point, uh, William Todd Jones, were amongst its first members. It soon adopted a stance in line with Sharman views, Sharman's views, resolving in April 1790 that when an unmasked and shameless system of ministerial corruption manifests an intention to sap the spirit, virtue and independence of Parliament, it's time for the people to look to themselves or they must soon sink into the most ignominious slavery. However, the club quickly became deadlocked on the unavoidable and pressing issue of Catholic emancipation. A number of Presbyterian radicals, such as the linen merchant and volunteer William Sinclair, argued that the revolution had proven the suitability of Catholics for democratic political rights. But Charlemagne and other established leaders wanted the question quashed uh, as inherently divisive. Despite this, its members were at this point united in regarding the outcome events in France as beneficial. And in July 1791, the Northern Whig Club organized an event at which the volunteers and inhabitants of Belfast were invited to meet to pass approving resolutions uh, on the French Revolution. And it was to Charman, uh, Colonel Sharman that they turned to act as chair for this Belfast meeting in July 1791. And it's over his name, as you can see here, uh, that the resolutions were issued, um, uh, uh, welcoming the revolution as men, citizens and volunteers. The resolution went on to restate the political relevance of the volunteers in quasi-revolutionary terms, declaring that we think the force of the people should form the guarantee of freedom and that their freedom is the only sure guarantee of public happiness. Charman himself acted with Henry Joy as conduits between the Belfast Committee and contacts in the French National Assembly, as well as revolutionary societies in Nantes and Bordeaux. And in addition to these proceedings, Charman also presided over the volunteer demonstration or what, what might be better described as political as a political pageant that celebrated both the American and French revolutions um, on the 14th of July, 1791 in Belfast. Um, and, connected, and sought to connect these events to the emerging campaign against colonial slavery and to the Irish campaign for parliamentary reform. 
At the, uh, and this is obviously, again, another late 19th century reimagining of, of, of this parade through Belfast in, uh, by John Kerry, um, or the one that followed the following year in 1792. At the ensuing dinner, multiple toasts were drunk in praise of American and French revolutionary ideas and heroes, uh, to the Patriot King of Poland, as well as to the King of Ireland, to English reformers, including Tom Paine, to parliamentary reform and the abolition of the popery laws, to Lord Charlemont, and a perpetuity to the volunteer army. A toast was also made to the Society for Abolishing the Slave Trade, already a popular cause in Belfast, but rendered more so by the temporary residents in the town of Olaudo Equiano, a former slave and campaigner for emancipation, who sold 1900 copies of his memoir, The Interesting Narrative, during his Irish visit of 1791 to two. Unquestionably, the Bastille celebrations of 1791 were the pinnacle of William Sharman's political career, placing him quite literally at the center of a demonstration of unmuzzled Belfast radicalism. However, developments were afoot that would render his political vision marginal and divide the celebrants of 1791 into opposing camps. Despite the choreographed unity of the Bastille Day parades in July, the volunteers still publicly disagreed on the Catholic question and a resolution for full or, and immediate emancipation prepared by the Dublin lawyer, uh, Theobald Wolf Tone, on behalf of the most radical of the Belfast activists was defeated at the public meeting. A secret committee within the Belfast volunteers, including Samuel Nielsen and Henry Joy McCracken, and taking inspiration from William Drennan's scheme for a benevolent conspiracy, a plot of the people had been formed in May 1791 and was not prepared to accept the cautious gradualism proposed by the majority. The committee began working to establish a secret society to, to take forward the agenda of connecting full and immediate Catholic emancipation to radical parliamentary reform. Now, in 1792, an attack of gout led to Colonel Sharman taking a lower profile during Bastille, the Bastille Day celebrations of, of, of that year. And his old colleague from the Dungannon Conventions, John Crawford, um, major of the independent County Down Regiment and a friend of Drennan and the McTeers, replaced him as the reviewing general at the Belfast Volunteer demonstration of the 14th of July, 1792. But Colonel Sharman was toasted in absentia, nevertheless. Um, and um, uh, a fiery and anti-monarchical address from the citizens of Belfast to the French National Assembly, penned by Drennan, was approved by acclamation at the associated public meeting, and Wolf Tone's more carefully worded resolution for Catholic emancipation was now also passed by a substantial majority, albeit with opposition from figures such as Wardle Cunningham and Henry Joy. Rumours that Sharman had withdraw from, withdrawn from the 1792 demonstration due to opposition to the alleged allegedly seditious resolutions proposed in the second address of the, to the National Assembly were vociferously rejected by members of his regiment, the Union, the Union Regiment of Volunteers, in a letter in letters to the Northern Star, um, which had recently been established by Samuel Nielsen as uh, a rival to Henry Joy's more moderate newsletter. The writer urged the movement to remain united in, in its adherence to radical reform and to spurn conspirators and address total confidence uh, in the political commitment of his regimental commander. Sharman himself had written previously to the regiment stating that you are now going to commemorate a revolution which has restored 26 millions of the human race to the dignity of human nature from the lowest state of slavery. And I, I make no doubt that every man of you would feel satisfaction in rejoicing on such an occasion. So there's no real evidence that that Sharman has uh, come out against um, uh, has, has come out against, sorry, uh, I'm kind of losing my slides there, has come out against the revolution by this point. Um, and indeed, the regiment maintained a consistent reputation for radicalism and support for Catholic emancipation. Indeed, in August 1792, Sharman vetoed the application of two newly formed companies to join it on the grounds that they were, they, they were, they held peep a day boy principles, that is, of association with anti Catholic secret societies. Charman was again fit to review the volunteers of his regiment and visited contingents, uh, and visiting contingents now swollen to 860 men and nine new uh, corps gathered at Tremor on the 19th of September, 1792, which unbeknownst to those present would be the last of these events in the county. Speaking to the ranks, he urged them to maintain volunteer discipline, uphold the law equally between Catholics and Protestants and against all disturbers of the peace, 
and continued to pursue parliamentary reform. And again, he welcomed the revolution in France as representing the fall of tyranny and as a harbinger of simultaneous reform across all the three kingdoms. Now, in December um, 1792, Sharman issued an address to the volunteers of Ireland calling for our, an, another convention uh, to demand reform and, and, and emancipation, a call that was taken up by a Belfast town meeting and established, uh, an, organizing, and, and established an organizing committee for Ulster. Sharman was elected um, to the final Ulster Volunteer Convention that met in Dungannon in February 1793, and indeed was again elected president uh, of that meeting. Uh, and there's no reason to, to question that he uh, did not support the resolutions of the county delegates for County Antrim agreed at Ballymena on the 14th of January, which were for full and immediate Catholic emancipation. There's evidence that this position had widespread support from the localities, at least in the northeastern counties. The Banbridge volunteers, uh, which almost certainly included some of Sharman's own tenants, for example, resolved that as citizen soldiers, they were loyal to the Crown and Constitution, but were also firmly committed to parliamentary reform, by which they meant a full and fair representation of all, in block capitals, the people in the Commons House, uh, and, with, and without which we cannot be satisfied. So at this Dungannon Convention, um, uh, as Chair Sharman endorses the resolutions passed in the sense of the people for extensive parliamentary reform, including the abolition of all boroughs, frequent elections, reallocation of representation based on population and the wealth of districts, and immediate and entire Catholic emancipation. Now, there are some tensions uh, at, at Dungannon in 1793. Um, uh, the the uh, resolutions, while they're very strongly anti-war and uh, ma for maintaining the existence of the of the volunteers, uh, also uh, declare support for maintaining the existing constitutional connection with Britain through the crime, uh, which uh, is, is 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 too moderate um, for many of the incipient United Irishmen, many of whom are are present, including um, Lord Edward Fitzgerald um, uh, at that meeting. So the the. The convention breaks up by establishing uh, a, a um, standing committee under Sharman with the aim of summoning another national convention. But before that, that can take place, the government uh, acts, the war is broken out, and the government acts to suppress the volunteer movement uh, by executive fiat uh, and passes legislation to prevent any further congresses or, or conventions taking place. So by 1793, um, uh, the, the, the kind of the non-revolutionary reformist movement is essentially shut down by government coercion. And also by that time, the politics of Sharman and his generation of volunteer leaders were becoming anachronistic. Approached in 1790 by the future Belfast United Irish leader, Samuel Nielsen, about supporting a plan for a standing committee of the independent interest in County Antrim, Sharman refused to support any form of political organisation that required voters to pledge their allegiance to a political platform, arguing that this would compromise the free agency and conscious, conscience of the independent elector. So he's not in support of, of like programmatic political movements. This mutual misunderstanding came to a head in 1791 when Samuel McTeer passed to Sharman a copy of Drennan's paper proposing the formation of a quasi-Masonic secret radical society within the volunteers. Not comprehending it, Sharman passed it to his friend George Black, former sovereign of Belfast, who gives it to his son, who sends it to Dublin Castle. So despite his high patriotic reputation, Sharman was something of a security risk to the incipient United Irishman. Nevertheless, despite this, Wolf Tone, who met him at Balna Hinch in, seven, in August 1792, remained very respectful of him and praised his anti-aristocratical sent sentiments in his private diary. So what's left of the non-revolutionary platform collapses from 1793 as Britain's war with France polarizes opinion and the state security clampdown outlaws the volunteers and leads to the creation of a new state controlled militia. Many old volunteers such as Sharman withdraw to their estates or from, or from active politics. Uh, uh, and some go further, of course, uh, and uh, join the counter-revolutionary yeomanry um, in the lead up to the rebellion of 1798. Uh, Sharman doesn't do this, but unlike, uh, uh, unlike his friends, Henry Joy and William Bruce, he gives no overt support to that movement. By 1798, the Orange Order was active in Moira, essentially controlled the town of Moira by 1798, and numerous arrests were made in the dragooning of Ulster. Um, 
Uh, and of course, um, when the Bath when the Ulster Rebellion breaks out um, in in uh, June um, 1798, and the County Down Rebellion uh, breaks out that month, it's bloodily suppressed at the Battle of Balna Hinch, um, and, and you know, Lord Morris' house at Montalto is sacked uh, as as part of that battle. Um, in July 1799, a triumphalist orange demonstration was held at Mora Castle, which the artist Gabriel Berenger, then a house guest at, at the castle, suggested was imposed upon the residents, that is the Sharmans, with at least a superficial display of orange colours being required for their personal safety. So there's a kind of a humiliation uh, of the former reformers uh, by the Orange Order. But William Sharman evidently clung to, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion here, Sharman evidently clung to the um, to the symbolic memory of volunteering, even as its legacies appeared to be disintegrating around him. At some point during the cataclysmic year of 1798, you know, when R Robinson, I I the English painter, is, is kind of painting this great canvas of his on the, off the Battle of Balna Hinch, very much from the British perspective. Uh, at some point in that year, um, Sharman invites Robinson to come to Moira Castle and to paint him in his uniform, his now defunct uniform, as the Colonel of the, of the Union Volunteers. Sharman chose to be represented sitting outdoors in his domain, wearing his now obsolete uniform of the, as Colonel of the Union, Union Regiment of Volunteers and prominently displaying his silver regimental gorget of office. A volunteer review is shown as taking place in the background outside Mora Castle, and the Colonel is holding a motion for reform in his left hand and what appears to be a draft patriotic speech lying atop a sword by his elbow. The demeanor of calm defiance with which Robinson depicts his face suggests the sitter's belief that despite the disasters of that year, the ideals of the movement would yet to be vindicated. And, and there's evidence uh, of, of a continuing belief uh, uh, in, uh, of that in, in Charman's private papers from the same year. But William, uh, had a, uh, William Charman had a debilitating stroke in 1799, um, uh, and um, he dies at Moira Castle in 1803. An encomium written after his death by his friend Henry Joy in the Belfast newsletter praised his patriotic endeavours but added, echoing Joy's own controversial turn to loyalism from 1793 that Sharman subsequently withdrew from public affairs in face of the licentious infatuations of the Republicans. And that may perhaps be more a reflection of Joy's own self-justification rather than an accurate reflection of Sharman's actions. An elegiac sonnet Followed in the paper, praising Sharman, lamented Sharman, is no more a friend, um, the friend of genius to his country dear, a patriot proved inflexible, sincere. So in conclusion, what could be said about the politics of volunteering as manifested by William Sharman, a second rank, but nevertheless, highly regarded figure in the Ulster movement. Inevitably, um, it has been overshadowed by the more modern proto-nationalist republicanism of the United Irishman. The Whiggish constitutionalism of volunteering politics was already under strain by the mid 1780s and collapsed and eclipsed by the highly, in the highly polarized and febrile politics dominant from 1793 onwards. However, the patriotic reformist politics of volunteering were not without their successes, especially in 1779 to 82, and articulated what in 18th century terms was a radical constitutionalist alternative to the constitutional status quo. It is clear from the history of Sharman's Union Regiment that active volunteering continued in mid-down and the Lagan Valley throughout the politically regressive years of the later 1780s before being enthused by the news of the fall of the Bastille in 1789. Constitutionalist reformers such as Sharman welcomed the revolution in France and continued to regard the citizen in arms as an essential lever to extracting reform from a recalcitrant and corrupt parliament. And it was only the war with France which permitted the state to expand and mobilize its own military forces and to repress the volunteers as potentially seditious that undermined this position. However, without the volunteer mobilizations, the United Irishman would not have been possible. The volunteering's legacy was contested by both constitutional nationalists such as Daniel O'Connell later on, and also by Protestant radicals such as William Sharman's son, William Sharman Crawford, who takes that name after he marries uh, uh, John Crawford's daughter. Um, so William Sharman Crawford seeks in many ways, I think, to transcri transpose the politics of his father into a very different, into the very different conditions of the 19th century. And I'll just finish with this, this portrait. This is a, a painting in the Ulster Museum collections entitled, uh, by uh, Thomas Robinson, entitled Portrait of a Young Man, Possibly a United Irishman, 1798. Highly unlikely it's of a United Irishman 
painted in 1798. And I think, although the provenance of the painting is unclear, I think this, my view is that this painting is probably, and I may be wrong here, probably a painting of William Sharman Jr. becomes William Sharman Crawford at the age of 17 or 18, painted at the same time that Robinson is painting his father's portrait at Moira Castle in 1798. And it's a reminder, I think, that um, the ideas and the if you are, ideals uh, of William Sharman and volunteering are carried forward uh, into the 19th century through through his son uh, in later years. I'm sorry I've gone a bit over time, but that's that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.